Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to our midweek Bible studies. We are excited to have you here with us tonight. It's a joy and a privilege to be able to come together and share and teach the Word of God and to uh, minister to you. We don't take this lightly at all. We are very serious about our time together as we share in ministry and uh, serving you with teaching the Word of God. And we just pray the Lord's Spirit would meet us every time we share, every time we're here. Um, wherever two or three are gathered together in the Lord's name, Jesus says that he will be there in the midst of us. And we are gathered together two or three and gathered around screens, around televisions and uh, tablets and iPhones across the city, around the state, around the country, and even in some parts of the world. And so um, we are just grateful to be here with our family tonight. Uh, we're going to pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together as we spend this time in his word tonight. Father, I thank you for giving us the spirit of your grace. And Lord, anointing us, allowing us to be present tonight, to be here, um, and to share in this time of teaching. We pray, God, that your spirit would meet us here. We would have an awareness of your presence. That, Lord, as we're teaching and as we're sharing, that you would arrest our attention, take over this lesson, and speak to the hearts of your people. I thank you, God, that there is no one like you. And Father, we give you praise. And we ask you now that you will send the perfect teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let him abide with us. Let him stay with us as your word is taught. And we'll give your name praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen again. Amen, amen. Welcome to each of you to our Bible studies. Well, I want to begin by just mentioning to you uh, that your prayers are needed and deeply requested uh, for one of our members. Well, um, the family, uh, this is the De La Cruz family, and they have moved to Boston, Massachusetts. It's been now a year or so, but um, we just uh, still claim them as our family. They, this is their home, their church home, and they are personal friends of um, Monica, Lady Monica and myself, my wife and I, and we just love the De La Cruz's so, so, so much. Well, today, this is a praise report. Today, Dakar De La Cruz um, underwent surgery uh, for cancer, and uh, the surgery went well is the report that we're receiving. We don't have any more details than that, but the surgery was very, very well today. And actually, her family developed these T-shirts, and so I'm wearing one of those T-shirts now. I don't know if you guys are able to get a uh, clear shot of this T-shirt. But I am wearing one of the t-shirts today, and it's a t-shirt that reminds uh, their family and all of her friends across the country to pray for her and to pray for her healing, that God would do a specific and a great work in her life. And she's using the acronym STAB, um, and STAB stands for God Will S Strengthen Us. Um, he strengthens us even in our times of sorrow and weakness. Um, and the T is that God will give us triumph in our uh, torment and in our troubles. And the A in STAB stands for God will anoint us with a special anointing to attack the uh, anguish and the anxiety. And the B stands for God will bless us and give us breakthrough even in our breaking. And so we are believing that God is going to stab every plan of the enemy in the life of Dakar and her family and that she is going to recover. She is going to be 100% well. This is our faith. This is our confidence and our trust. And I want to join, ask you to join us as a family that we would all please lift up her name and pray for her that God would continue the healing process and that God would continue the recovering process. There is something powerful when the people of God come together in prayer. Guys, there's a power when we come together as a family and we pray. So I'm praying that you will please join us in prayer. And we have other members of our church 
who are actually going into surgeries this week and going through operations this week and I don't have the uh, liberty and the, um, the permission to give all the names of those who are having surgery, but um, there is a mom and dad, a father and mom that's having their son, their adult son, that's going to be going through surgery tomorrow. And I'm asking if you would please keep them in prayer. There was a prayer a call today that was given um, on their behalf, and I'm asking for the church to please remember the Baileys. Remember the Baileys in your prayers, if you would. Please remember the Baileys. We love uh, them so deeply. Please remember them in your prayers. We know that God is a healing God, and he's able to do the impossible. So we thank God for it in advance. We never worry about outcomes. We never worry about what's going to transpire or what's going to happen. We know that our God is an able God and all things are in his hands. We're going to be teaching about that tonight in the book of Revelation, that all things are in the hands of him who sits on the throne. And if he's on the throne, the good news is that everything is going to be all right. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Everything is going to be all right, all right. Amen. So please remember them. Of course, remember the Latsons in your prayers, uh, Don and Joyce. Remember them in your prayers and in your thoughts as we are praying for Joyce's complete and total recovery and healing. Please keep them in your prayers. And also, if you would, please um, remember the Robertsons in your prayer, Eric and Veronica, Reverend Robertson and Veronica Robertson. Remember them. We love the Latsons and Robertsons so, so deeply. And we just know that God has great things in store for them, and God has a great testimony to give to them. They are both both in great spirits and they're both um, having the spirit of the Lord just overshadowing their attitude and their uh, disposition as they're going through a extremely enormously enormously difficult season a difficult time so please keep uh, them in prayers and all those who we may not have mentioned please remember them uh, in your prayers as well amen amen and speaking of t-shirts I need to mention that my sister-in-law, uh, Sister Melissa is who I, is what I call her, um, but uh, she calls me Martin. But anyway, my sister-in-law, um, she gave me a T-shirt. I'm not wearing it tonight, but it's the best T-shirt in the world. And here's what the T-shirt says. It says, this T-shirt was given to me by my favorite sister-in-law. <laughs> That's what the T-shirt says. So next week, or the next time we share, I may just wear uh, Sister Melissa's T-shirt. Just want to give a big, big shout out to her. Love you, sis. Love you, sis. All right, well, let's uh, get into the Word of God. But before we do, I want to make certain that you guys are reminded of a few announcements. Um, one is about our warming station. And we are asking everyone here to please give a donation to the warming station in the form of blankets and uh, linen sheets, in the form of blankets and sheets. Now, we need them to come specifically from... Amazon. So we have developed an Amazon wish list, and there should be a, um, a flyer that's on your screen or going to be on your screen. It's for blankets and sheets. We are having a wish list in Amazon just for those blankets and just for those sheets. You'll see a QR code. I want to leave it up for just a moment so you can grab your smartphones, please. Grab your tablets, and I want you to scan that QR code. Please take a moment now, scan the QR code, and it will take you directly to the Amazon wish list so that you can send the blankets and sheets that we are specifically requesting. Now, I know that you have blankets and sheets at your house that you can donate. I know that, but there's a couple of things we need. One, we need them to be all uniform so that every cot and every bed section in our station gets the same sheets and the same blankets, and that way we're treating everybody the same in our warming station and then secondly um, the sizes are critical we want to make certain that it is the proper and appropriate size for the beds that we have in the station so we have already pre-sized it we know exactly what those sizes are we're asking for everyone to please get those specific sheets and so this is for blankets and sheets in our warming station 
go to Amazon.com and uh, click on the uh, wish list and just type in New Life Community Alliance wish list or warming station, uh, New Life Warming Station wish list. If you type that in to the search bar, we will come up and you'll see the warming station. And we're asking you, listen, it is $30, less than $30. Um, would be able to get blankets and sheets for uh, for a bed less than thirty dollars and so we've made certain that it is affordable um, that you can do that if you don't have the ability to scan on a QR code you still can participate by donating the thirty dollars tonight you can donate the thirty dollars uh, tonight and we'll give you a chance to do that when we lift our offering so please ma'am please sir let's be the church let's do the work that God's called us to do and let's give these blankets and these sheets that, that are needed for our warming station. Good news about the warming station is that we have been consistent in seeing 40 to 45 um, uh, individuals in our warming station. There are guests, there are family, our friends, and we're starting to know each one of their stories and know them by name and hearing, you know, who they are and where they come from literally changes the face of homelessness. It is a powerful experience. If you've never volunteered at all, may I encourage you to sign up as a volunteer tonight. Don't wait. Sign up as a volunteer tonight. There is a QR code that will be on your screen that will uh, allow you to go straight to our volunteer portal and sign up as a the website where you can sign up as a volunteer. I'm begging you to please help us in this winter very strong. Many have wondered how, what days is the warming center open? Seven days a week. Seven days a week. Our warming center is open seven days a week regardless of the weather, regardless of the temperature. It's as long as the winter lasts. And so by the end of March, we'll be able to shut down the warming station. But for all of this month of February and all of next month of March, let's go strong. Let's go strong. If you've never volunteered, you've never even considered volunteering, I'm praying the Lord would speak to your heart today and that you would stop by. You're able to stop by. We have gloves for you to wear if you're concerned about sanitation. We have gloves. We also have masks for you to put on if you're concerned about sanitation and health concerns, then you can put our mask on. We have gloves for everyone uh, to wear. We serve a hot meal um, to each person that's there and simply helping get the beds and sections together before our guests come in, making certain they are settled for the night, and then we go home. We do multiple shifts, and I'm praying that you will participate as a volunteer in this station. Let's be the church. Let's do the work that you know the church is supposed to be doing. This is what you said that you believe the church is supposed to do. Um, you have said, I have said it, that why are all these churches and none of these churches are doing this? Well, we're doing it. We're doing it, and we believe God's called us to do this, and he is anointing what we are doing in a major, major way. So I just thank and praise God for you. I want to mention as well. As we lift our offering tonight, that the Lord has blessed us with a wonderful grant um, uh, that we've received uh, from uh, one of our local foundations here in the city. And um, I'm just overjoyed about having received this. It helps us do the ministry and the work that God's called us to do. And I remember the days when we were praying the Lord would give us, you know... Uh, God's called you to, so be faithful tonight in your giving. As we lift this offering, I want you to give generously and liberally and faithfully to the work of the kingdom in this community. Everything you give on Wednesdays, and you know this, 100% of it goes directly into the lives of those who need them in our community. Absolutely 100% of it. It does not cover the need. In no way does it cover the need. We cover that through tithes and offerings 
comes in givings from our church's budget, but this does put a dent in that. So I'm asking you to be faithful in your giving tonight. Amen? All right, all right. Enough about that. Father, bless this offering. Allow it to give you glory. We honor you, Lord, for the privilege we have to give tonight. We recognize that we give because you've given to us. Now would you return back to us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. In Jesus' name, amen and amen again. All right, let's take out our smartphones and uh, let's all prepare uh, to give tonight. And then we'll be right back right after this with the word of the Lord for tonight. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. God's people said amen. All right. Well, we got just a few minutes uh, to jump into this, so let's get right into the Word of God tonight. Open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter number 4. Chapter 4, we're beginning our second segment of this book. Our second segment of this book, these are the things that are yet to come. Before we do that, would you please help me put in the chat space a really, really huge thank you to Dr. Morsi Beasley for teaching so passionately, so intelligently about the book of Revelation. He was our teacher, our co-teacher throughout the entire uh, seven church ages, week after week. I can't tell you how much of a joy it was to share with him every single Wednesday night. And I pray that you are blessed uh, by us, you know, these two guys just, just talking about the scriptures and how much we love um, the Lord and this book and the message of this book. And I pray that it was a blessing to you as we walked through these uh, seven churches. And then last week, Dr. Beasley taught on the uh, church at Laodicea. And what an amazing teaching with great insight that he gave on last week. I pray that you garnered much from that teaching on last week. He is such a blessing to the body of Christ, and I'm so grateful to God to have him as a part of our teaching team, a part of our staff team, our ministry team. We are really blessed to have Dr. Beasley on our team. So um, please put in the chat space a big thank you to him, uh, and we're going to bring him back as we continue walking through this book, and we're also going to talk with others on our teaching and ministry staff here as well, and they'll serve as co-teachers with us as we teach through this book. But tonight, let's look at Revelation chapter number 4. Revelation chapter 4. Now, you remember, of course, that we have covered all of the seven churches. We've covered all the seven churches. And so the Bible says in... in what is now modern-day Turkey, about 100 miles from each other. And all seven of these churches were vibrant and active at the time that John uh, was writing to them. And as John sent these letters, these letters are prophetic in that they not only speak to the conditions of the church and the cities that the churches were in, 
but they also speak to the prophetic condition of the church ages that would persist after and far beyond uh, this time that John is writing, even persist even unto the days and age of our current church age. And so I'm asking that you would um, be certain to uh, remember what was taught. And so we said the first church, of course, is a church at Ephesus, and we studied the letter to the church at Ephesus, the church that lost its first first love. You have lost your first love. And then, of course, we study the church at Smyrna. The church at Smyrna is the suffering church. This is the church that had no, nothing negative said about it at all. No accusations were made against this church because this was the church that suffered. And then our third church is the church at Pergamos, the place where Satan's seat is. And this is the compromising church, the church that have compromised their faith. It compromised its relationship with God. It blended. That's what uh, Pergamum means. It means to mix or to blend this amalgamation and blending of secular and sacred together. And we studied the dangers of a church that does not have a pure confession of Jesus Christ, but has mingled that confession with words worldly living, worldly lifestyle, and worldly worldly ways. And its companion church is a church at, at um, the church at Thyatira. It's the companion church to uh, the church at Pergamos. It is the idolatrous church. It takes what Pergamos has dabbled in, and it takes it to another level. As a matter of fact, this church um, is the church where uh, they are suffering the teachings of, um, of, of, of Jezebel and Balaam. You have this doctrinal improper teaching done in this church, and we we see it here in the church at uh, Thyatira. And then there is the church at Sardis, the spiritually dead church. This church is even worse because it is spiritually dead. And as it is spiritually dead, it has a reputation that it is alive, but the church is actually dead. And this cat, this characterizes so many churches in our modern culture today that are in essence dead. Not meaning that the worship is dead. I mean the spiritual lives of the people are dead. The ritual dead. The liturgy is dead. The, the, the purity, the holiness, the godly character dead. But people think it's alive because it's a church and they have on their Sunday go to meet and close, but inwardly it is dead. And then of course the church at Philadelphia is a church, the second one that had no negatives to be said about this church at all. Nothing negative said about it at all. It is a faithful church. This is the church that even though persecuted, it was faithful to the call of God, so faithful that he says, I set before you an open door, an open door to spread the gospel for even more ministry, for even more impact, and for even more souls. And there are churches around the world right now that are operating in very hotly contested, uh, persecuting environments, but they are faithful to the Lord, even in the midst of great persecution. And so we studied the faithful church of Philadelphia, and then last uh, time together, Dr. Beasley taught about the church at Laodicea. And the church at Laodicea is the lukewarm church. And this church is analogous to our current church age. And we didn't get into the matching of the churches to the age of the church throughout church history, um, because I think Think it's a difficult match to make one-to-one -one in full parallels between history and the church itself. But this one is not difficult to make. It's the last church, and I believe it corresponds to the last church age, the one just before Christ comes back, and it is an apathetic church, lukewarm, no passion, no drive, that this church is a church that is not on fire for God. It doesn't weep when people are lost. It is not engaged in mission. It's not engaged uh, on the mission.
church. We see them being lived out and displayed in this church at Laodicea, this modern day church today, not any particular church, but the church as a whole is lukewarm. And Jesus says, because it's lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. He says, literally, I'm sickened by the apathy that the church is expressing. And so with this close to the age of the church, with this close to the church ages, we enter now into Revelation chapter 4, and your Bible should be open there. And as we come to Revelation chapter 4, we see this beautiful, magnanimous, amazing picture of heaven. The throne of God, the seat of God, this, this amazing picture of what glory is going to look like. And so, because of that, I want us to jump in. I want to read the whole chapter to us, if I could, for the moment. I want to read the entire chapter. It says, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads and from the throne proceeded lightnings thunderings and voices seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of god before the throne there was a sea of glass and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. And the third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And verse 9 says, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a picture of heaven. What an amazing picture of this rapturous, amazing place called heaven. This is the place you and I are going. It is a prepared place for a pre. Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1. 
In Ezekiel chapter number one, Ezekiel saw this magnanimous picture of heaven. He saw this beautiful, rapturous array of God's glory in heaven. He saw these living creatures just as uh, were seen by, uh, by John the Revelator. And as he sees them, he says, and heaven was opened unto me. Now, what this says is that no one understands or sees heaven unless God opens it up to us. There is mystery in heaven. There is this idea of an opening that has to happen. It's not just the opening of heaven in the physical aspect, but it's the opening of the mind to heaven, the opening of the heart to heaven, the opening of the understanding to heaven. So when John says, and I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. It's not a physical door that's open and closed. That's the imagery. But the mystery behind the image is that the door of his understanding, the door of his enlightening, the door of his eyes were open. You remember the story in the Old Testament whenever Elisha, uh, the prophet, was surrounded by the armies of Syria. Um, he was surrounded by this armies of Syria that were coming uh, because of King uh, Ben-Hadad's um, edict to uh, arrest Elijah and bring him before the Syrian court. And as Elisha comes out of his house and he sees these armies and chariots are, that are all surrounding him, his servant Gehazi is standing with him and he is he's scared, he's frightening, and he says, alas, master, what shall we do? Look, we're surrounded. And, and Elijah says, oh, Lord, open his eyes so that he can see. And when Elisha prayed that prayer that God would open his servant's eyes, you remember what happened, and that is Gehazi immediately had his eyes opened, and he saw on the mountains around uh, Elijah's home the chariots of fire, the army of the Lord, angels all around he saw it because his eyes were open. His eyes were open. This is exactly what happens here in this uh, fourth chapter to John. It's what happened to Ezekiel when he saw his vision. His eyes were open and it, it peeled back, if you will. It peeled back this door to see the glories of heaven. And so it says there was a door opened in heaven. Now, not only is it open in heaven for him to see it and his understanding to understand it, but it's for his heart to receive it, to be filled with it. That heaven is not for those who are not passionate about it. I got to make this very clear. The Bible says that he's coming back for all those who love his appearing. We love his appearing. We wait long for that day when he comes to rescue us from this earth. We long for that day when we stand before God and receive our reward. He, we love the appearing of the Lord Jesus. I want to see him. I want to look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. This is the prayer of the believer. We have a passion for heaven. It's a passion for heaven. The Bible says we were created for this purpose. We were created for heaven. I want you to see this in Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 11, I want you to look at what it says here about the passion of the human heart, the passion of the human soul, that there's something in you that longs for more, that yearns for something greater. You know that there's more to this life than the life you are living. God deposited in you and me this longing for glory. And it says in verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. That's mean, that means that everything God has made serves a beautiful purpose. 
not it's a beautiful rose or a beautiful plant or a beautiful landscape, a beautiful mountain, beautiful waterfall, not just that kind of beauty, but it's a purposeful beauty, that it serves its purpose in its time. It's a beautiful thing when a plan comes together, right? It's a beautiful thing when God's purposes come together. It's a beautiful thing when things happen as God has designed them to happen, when everything takes place as God has ordered and ordained it to be. That's a beautiful thing, and he has made everything beautiful in its time. Everything follows the purpose of God. Everything operates by the purposes of God. He made it all beautiful. Sin marred it. Sin stained it. Sin has destructed, has a destructive power on it, but he made it beautiful. And it says, also, he has put eternity in their hearts. He has put eternity in their hearts. Do you see this? That God put eternity, the fathomless reaches of eternity. God has wired it in the heart, the passion, the desire of every human being. That you and I are longing for it. This is why you want meaning out of your life. This is why you question, what does my life mean? What is my life about? Why am I here? Because you get this nagging sense that you are on the earth. greater than just money. You're here for something greater than just friends. You're here for something far more significant on the earth. And this is the, this is what he means when he says he has put eternity in the hearts of of his people. This is the longing for God, this yearning for the knowledge of God, this yearning for knowing him, understanding him, having a relationship with him. Eternity, eternity. Eternity is not a time. Eternity is not, you know, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and it never ends. Yes, it is in a normal understanding, but eternity means much more than that. Eternity is the domain of God. Eternity is the dwelling place of God. It is where the perfect quality of the knowledge of God is felt, seen, and known. That's eternity. It is where God lives. It is this realm that is occupied by God. And it says he put the desire for that. He put the passion for that. He put a longing for that in every human being's heart, in the atheist's heart, in the agnostic's heart, in the hardened criminal's heart, in the believer's heart, in the sinner's heart. Everyone has this desire that says, why am I here? Why do I exist? What is my life about? It's the knowledge you and I have. That there's something greater. There's something bigger than us. There's something more significant than us. That our lives cannot be consumed with ourselves. So God, he wrapped the seed of, inter of eternity, the meaning of godliness, and he deposited it in our hearts. And it says... He has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the word. Fully understand eternity. Eternity is so vast. There's no way you could fully grasp its full meaning. You cannot, you can't put your hands and wrap your mind around the full reaches of God's glory. And so it says, no one can figure out his work. You can't even determine and figure out the ways that nature works. We don't even know what makes the heart beat. We don't have a clue as to how electricity got in the body. We know it keeps the heart beating with a defibrillator, electrical current, but we don't know how it got there. We know we can explain life, but we cannot tell you how life works. 
No science, no medicine, no medical doctor can explain to you why the heart beats, why the embryo in the womb soon has a heartbeat that beats. We cannot explain why the cells multiply. We can tell you how it multiplies. We can tell you through what process it goes through to multiply. We cannot tell you why. Can I tell you why? We can't tell you why the body receives the chemicals it receives from your food and how it translates that food into energy or into growth, into skin, bones, and you grow. No one can tell you why that happens. We know that it happens. We know how it happens. We can describe it to the T and correct it when it ain't happening right, but we cannot tell you why because this is the secret to life, the secret to life. Somebody said, we're cloning people now, and because we're cloning people, um, we have the ability to play God. And I say, no, you don't. Cloning people, if you can clone a full human being, you can clone a kidney, you can clone a lungs, you can clone a heart, you can clone a full human being, but you did not start from nothing. You had to have some stem cells to begin with. God had no stem cells. He did not call life from life. He called life from nothing. It is ex nihilo nihil fit is the Latin term that says out of nothing, 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 nothing comes. comes. But God, God takes ex nihilo nihil fit and turns it upside down and says ex nihilo summa fit out of nothing everything comes. Everything comes. God, God spoke, spoke in into nothing, nothing and, and called something out of nothing. nothing. This, this is the God, God who speaks and, and declares. declares. And what he says is, and man cannot figure that out. It says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and do good in their lives. Also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor because it is the gift of God. I know, verse 14, he says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. <laughs> the purposes of God, not... plan does not change. Nothing can be added to it. Look at what it says. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. God does it that men should stand in awe of him. That God has established the boundaries of the earth. God has determined the days of our lives and existence. God has determined our destiny and preordained our steps. God has determined who we are and where our lives will end and how our lives will be lived. He has done it from eternity and no man can figure out the works that he does. And God, God does this. This, the Bible says, so that every man would stand before him in awe. In awe. Now listen carefully. What I just described is understood in a finite capacity by finite minds and by finite men. And I'm trying to describe it with my limited finite language. But when you stand before God, you will have a perfect being, a perfect body, and a perfect understanding. You will no longer be finite. You will no longer be limited. You will no longer have the limitations that we have today. And we will understand him with a mind and a heart that is without limitation. Hallelujah. And you think you're in awe of him now. And you understand that much of God. We understand a thimble full of God. Imagine how much awe you will have of him when you understand the ocean depth of God.
that you stand before him in all. That's what happens in Revelation. John has a door opened unto him. And in a moment, his mind is blown. And John understands something that he could never have understood unless God opened that trap. Remember the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We don't have time to go there. I want to go over this very quickly. Are you with me so far? You listening? All right. In 2 Corinthians chapter, thir- chapter number 12, it is Paul says, I knew such a one who was caught up in verse 1. He says, to the third heaven. He says, I was caught up, raptured to the third heaven. He says, and I heard visions and revelations that are not lawful for me to speak. He says, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. All I know is that for that moment in time, I was raptured from myself. And I heard visions and revelations and of God. He says, and it was so amazing, so masterful, so powerful that I couldn't even com- repeat it. I couldn't even explain it. Not lawful for me to speak. No one would understand it. This is what John saw in heaven. And this is what every single one of us will experience the moment we get there when the door opens in heaven. All right, all right, all right. You were made for this. Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. Scripture says, if in this Life only, we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. If this is all we get, this is a miserable condition to be in. I mean, this is it? (laughs) All I get is 80 years or 90 years of struggle and pain and and that's all I get. All I get is a few years with my children and then I have to go through their, their, uh, them leaving and going off to college and being married and my grandkids are here and then I have to experience a time when I've got to leave them to, to die and go to heaven. I mean, this is it. This is all I get, just a few bills to pay and a job to go to and a clock to clock in and clock out. This is it. It says, if in this life we only have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Most miserable. Paul says, hallelujah, thanks be to God. In this 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians where he speaks about the resurrection of the dead, he talks about Christ being first fruits of them that have slept. And because Christ rose from the dead, he's the first fruit. We are the rest of the harvest. And as Christ was risen from the dead, so shall we rise from the dead. And Paul says, man, in the midst of this idea of resurrection, he says, this is our hope. This is what we are looking for. This is what we are expecting because it is what gives us hope. It's what takes away the misery and gives us a melody of worship to God for heaven, for heaven. And so when we think about heaven, we're considering at least four significant things. And I won't have time to go through all of them in detail on tonight. Number one, it is a rapturous place. It's a place of rapture. Heaven is not a place you can locate on the map. You can't point to it and get there. It's not up and it's not down and it's not over there. You have to be raptured to get there. It is taken from myself to get there. It's a rapturous place. Number two, it's a real place. Though rapturous, it is real. Heaven is as real as this room that I'm teaching in tonight. It's as real as this Bible that I'm holding. It's as real as the lap, as, as the book in your lap or the tablet in your lap or the screen that you're watching. It's a real place. It's a real place that you can't get to through real physical means. <laughs> It is a real place you can't get to through physical means. Now, someone says, well, what in the world is that about? All right, I want to ask you this question. I want to ask you this question. Draw me a picture of love. Draw, how does it look? Draw me a picture of love. I want you to paint it for me. Draw me a picture. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Describe it in physical terms, love. Is it, is it tall? Is it short? 
Does it have hair or not? Love, describe it to me. Is it block? Is it, is it, uh, wh wh what's it, ma what's its material? Give me its, give me its metal, its metabolic makeup. Can't do that, can you? Because love is not a physical thing. But it's a real thing. It ain't physical, but it is real. Are you getting that idea? Right? Now, draw me a picture of joy. Can't, can't, can't do it. I mean, I mean, is it, is it tall? Is it short? Joy. You, you can't, because it's not a physical thing. But it's a real thing. And love and joy are as real as my fingers and toes. They're just real in a different dimension. They're real in a different understanding. They're real in a different realm, right? They're real in my soul. They're real in my psyche. They're real in my thoughts, my emotions, my feelings. They are real but not physical. Heaven is that way. It's real, it's not physical. It's real, it's not physical. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. A real place for you. And he says, and, and, and if it were not so, my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you it wasn't so. He says, I'm going to prepare that place for you. It's a real place. Heaven is not just a rapturous place. It's not just a real place. It's a royal place. It's a place of royalty. There's thrones there. There's authority there. There's immaculate wealth there. There's power there. It's royalty that is there. It is a place of You are being engaged. You are being active in heaven. You are as active in heaven as you are or more active there than you are on your job or in your career or in your house. It is a place of reward, a place of activity, a place of participation, not spectator. in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up here and I will show thee things which must be hereafter he says I heard a voice talking to me now this voice some have said is the voice of Jesus talking to John no it's not the voice of Jesus because when Jesus's voice speaks the Bible describes his voice as a thunder that his voice is thunder. We see this in uh, verse 1, in chapter number 1. His voice is thunderous. We see this throughout the revelation, right? When God speaks, it is thunder and lightning. This is a trumpet. A trumpet is a call to arms, a call to war. It is a summonsing. It's a summoning uh, instrument to summon people to an assembly, to call them together. It is an instrument of praise. It's a trumpet. It's a trumpet. Listen carefully. As a trumpet, it is an angel that calls him. Now, the angel is going to stand and blow the trumpet. This is the angel who declares that time shall be no more in Revelation 14. Declares time shall end, Revelation 7. That whenever this happens, the trumpet will declare this. The angel will declare at the last trump. It's an announcement that's made. So when it says that I heard the voice as it were of a trumpet, this harkens back to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 when Paul said, at the last trump, the voice shall sound at the last trump and we shall be changed, right? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he says this will happen at the last trumpet, meaning that there is going to be announcements made, announcements made. Right now, I'm making an announcement. I am a trumpet for God. I am his trumpet. I am calling you to salvation. I'm calling you to repentance. I'm calling you to Jesus Christ. I am one of the trumpets. 
and you're going to hear a message on Sunday, another trumpet. You're going to hear someone speaking the word on the ride to work tomorrow, another trumpet. You're going to turn on the TV or the radio and listen to a television or radio minister, another trumpet. You're going to read a book that's written by someone who wrote it about God, and that's another trumpet. There will be a last trumpet, final trumpet, a closing trumpet, an ending trumpet. <laughs> And at that trumpet, he will tell us, come up here. Come up here. This is the call of the rapture. This is the call of the church being gathered together unto God. Now, if you notice from chapter 4, all the way until we see the new Jerusalem, until we see the return of Christ again, you hear nothing more about the church Everything is about the earth, the land, the plagues, the, the tribulation, the anguish, the death. You hear no more about the church because the church is gone. It's raptured. It's caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. Now, I want to ask you a question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for him? Are you ready to meet him? Because the call is coming. The call is coming. It says he will call us to meet him in the air. Anabahode. Anabahode is Greek for come up here. Come up here. And that is the call that God's going to give whenever time shall stop. And the clock for our earthly existence ticks no more. And we move into the last seven years of man's existence on the earth. And God will rescue the church from the throes and from the hands and clutches of human life and this mundane earth, this flesh. You will hear that trumpet call and that trumpet call, Anna, Anna, behold, come up here. And we will be caught up to meet him. It says, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, Anabahode, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Which must take place after this. He says that he's going to remove the church. Now, here's what the church is going to experience. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to read through this very quickly because I want to make certain that we have time tonight to walk through. It says, for this we say, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. It says when he comes back, to capture and, and to gather his saints, we will not precede those who are asleep. It says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel. Remember I said it's an angel? With the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. What, what an amazing moment. I need to, you to capture the moment. Please capture the moment. Here you have, you're doing your daily duties. You're going about your day. You're at work, you're at home, wherever you are. You're in the gym, you, you're, you're out in the field, you are at a restaurant, you're at the movies, wherever you are, you're going about your day. And the trumpet sounds, Anabahode, and you hear the voice of God calling you. And when you hear that trumpet sound, everything stops. Your life stops, and you see the bodies of those who have been buried in Christ, those who have died in Christ, it says they will rise first. And they will come from the ground. They will come from cemeteries. They will come from graveyards. They will come from the sea, from the ocean, from the mountains. They will rise first. And somehow through the amazing miracle of resurrection, 
I don't know how it happens. I can't describe how it happens. But just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so shall we who die in Christ be raised from the dead. We are sown in the ground a mortal body, but we are raised from the ground an immortal body. We're sown in corruption but raised in incorruption. I don't understand how that happens. I can't explain it to you. That the decay and the rigor mortis and the decay of death that has set in to every person who has ever passed away. I mean, the worms will eat our body and destroy our flesh. But I don't know how it happens. But somehow that which goes in the ground in corruption comes out of the ground incorruptible as the Lord's body did, as Jesus' body has done. And it rises first. Now here's what I want you to hear. Here's what I want you to capture. Please understand this. If this were not so, why are we living? Why are we living? If you die... To be in the ground forever, what is the reward for life? What's the purpose of life? Good has no reward and evil has no punishment. There's no reward for living a good life and there's no punishment for living an evil life. If there is no resurrection from the dead, if the dead do not rise, if there is no life after death, then why do you do anything right or good or moral? Why? Why not live it up? Why not eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die? Why do you care about the hurting? Why do you have compassion for those who are, who are in need? Why do you do good deeds for family and good deeds for friends? Why do mothers care for their children? Why do you have a broken heart when you see a child being injured or harmed or hurt if there is no reward for any good whatsoever at all? And if there is no reward for good, then there is no punishment for evil. I mean, you could live as wicked and as ugly and as ill of a life as you possibly can and get away with it. I mean, look at the people who live wicked lives. Wicked lives and successful and wealthy and rich and powerful. Many of them are politicians or celebrities or living it high on the hog. And they're cheating and lying and harming and maiming and hurting people. And there's no, no punishment for evil whatsoever. Because there's no life after death. When you die, you're dead. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. And if that is how you see life, Paul says, we are of all men most but thanks be unto God, <laughs> there is a reward for the faithful. Thanks be unto God, there is a resurrection for the dead. Thanks be unto God, there is a life after this life. He says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. We who are alive and remain shall be with them and meet the Lord in the air, caught up with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What an amazing day. What a great day. When our loved ones crack through the grounds or crack through the seas. And whenever their bodies, I don't know how, I don't know how, don't ask me how. But it is risen incorruptible, incorruptible. And we will see this. We'll see mom, dad, we'll see this. We'll see this. We'll see cousin, auntie, friend, neighbor. We'll see this. And when they have risen to the Lord, we will be caught up in that moment 
enraptured with him in that very moment. Can you see it? Can you rise and see it? This is what John saw. Heaven is a rapturous place. It's not somewhere casual. It's not somewhere simplistic. It's a rapturous place. You only get there by rapture. You don't get there. You don't get to heaven by thinking. You don't get to heaven by contemplation. You don't get to heaven by having moral thoughts. You only get there by rapture, by the disembodying of the soul. And the soul carrying with it the whole nature of the Spirit of God. And it is caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's the only way we get there. It's a rapturous place. It's a real place. It's a royal place. It's a rewarding place. Let's say it together. It's a rapturous place. It's a real place. It's a royal place. It's a rewarding place. A place called heaven. When John says, he heard the voice, he heard the voice, Hanaba Hode, come up here, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And he says in verse 2, and immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around about the throne like unto an emerald. And around the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon these seats are thrones. He says, I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. It says that he saw these sitting and clothed. Now go back to verse 2 very quickly. It says, and I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. It is not only a rapturous place and a real place, but it is a royal place. There is a throne in heaven, and the full, the full center of heaven's power and focus is on the throne. Everything is around the throne. The throne is the center piece of heaven. If you can imagine this place as far as the eyes could see west and as far as the eyes could see east, as far as you can imagine, as far as you can see, all of the creatures and beings and people that are around heaven and all of them have their attentions turned to the throne. The first thing John sees is a throne in heaven. Now, I know, I know when you get to heaven, you want to see, I want to see, you know, Aunt May. I want to see uh, Uncle Lou. When I get to heaven, I want to see my cousin. I want to see Mama. I want to see, I get it. I know I get it. I get it. But when you get to heaven, you only going to want to see Jesus. <laughs> You're only going to want to see him. You'll know your loved ones, yes. You'll have this powerful, beautiful, amazing reunion with them after you see the throne. Because the throne is what draws us to him. And I only see my grandmother in light of the throne. I only see my dad in light of the throne. I only see my uncles in light of the throne. Are you getting it? Are you getting it? I see those whom I perform funerals for, whom I preach eulogies over. I see them in light of the throne. I don't see them in their old bodies, Mother Jefferson and Mother Johnson, Ruth John. I don't see them in their old bodies. I don't see them as I saw them on the earth. I only see them in light of the throne and right in the middle of heaven. Hear me. Right in the middle of heaven, he says, I saw a throne. A throne means power. It means authority. It means strength. And the throne is established in glory. And one that sat on the throne, he was too radiant to look at. So the Bible has all of these stones to describe what John saw. It's just like Ezekiel, exact same idea. So whenever you get to heaven, you're not going to see stones on a throne. But it's, it's, it's the blinding light of a throne. So uh, I've got my wedding ring here. This is my wedding ring, and I can't, I wish I, had, I was better able to do this. 
But in my wedding ring, um, there are small, tiny, itsy bitsy little, there are diamonds in the wedding ring. And whenever I put the light on that wedding ring, when I shine my light on it, as I move it, it begins to glisten. If it were larger and bigger, as I shine my light on it, it gets larger. And if I put that diamond right in the light the right way, it shines in my eyes, almost blinding. That's what it means by these gems. It's not physical gems on the throne. It's not physical stones on the throne. It's these beautiful gems, gem-like lighting. That to look at it is almost as if you're seeing the radiant light of the glory of God, which is piercing at us almost as if we were looking right in the midst of a sardius stone with a bright light shining and refracting that light in all of its beauty and all of its pristine glory. And we see this light almost dazzling and, and blinding to the eyes. That's what it's like to look at him on the throne. It's like peering right in the eye of a light bulb, a shining light bulb, peering right in those eyes. Remember, electricity hadn't been invented yet. They don't know anything about electricity. He can't describe this in ways we can see it. The best he can describe it is a beautiful stone that has a bright light like the sun shining through it and it blinds your eyes. He says, that's what I saw. Like a jasper stone. Like a sardius stone. He says, and then above the throne was this rainbow above the throne. This rainbow harkens back to Noah, the ark, and the rainbow that God put in the sky. But it speaks here of an emerald rainbow, this multicolored green rainbow, different shades of green around this, speaking of the peace of God's covenant that he had with Noah and the ark. And the peace of that covenant is immortalized by an everlasting sign of the covenant above the throne. So when you stand before God, you are constantly reminded of his covenant of peace and his covenant of grace that he will never destroy man with water again. This is the covenant of God that I am forever reminded when I peer at this amazing and beautiful and wonderful throne. And the one who sits on the throne is enthroned in power. The throne means he is in charge of the affairs of this life. The beautiful thing about life is that God is on the throne. God is in charge. God is in control. Nothing happens in your life unless God has decreed it or God has allowed it. And if God has decreed it, he has decreed it for a good purpose. And if God has allowed it, he has allowed it to bring to pass his good will in your life. He has a purpose for life. He is in charge of life. He is on the throne of your life. He is in control of everything that happens in your day. The sickness, the illness, he's in control of it. The pain, the agony, he is in control of it. The joy, the victory, the celebration, he is in control of it. The smile and the frown, he is in control of it. Right? Are you seeing this? This is the throne of God. And what I've just described to you, I'm describing it with limited understanding. With limited knowledge. I'm the best I'm doing is what I read in the word of God. My limited knowledge by the Holy Spirit giving me this understanding of the word of God to share it with you. That is the best I can do. But when we get to heaven, and I got to stop teaching. When we get to heaven, we will not have this limitation anymore. What I cannot understand on earth I will understand with greater clarity, with unlimited clarity in heaven. I will see his throne in a light and a perspective that I've never seen it before. I'll understand the power of that throne in a way I've never understood that power before. This is why we will bow before him. This is why we will worship him throughout all eternity. This is why. 
And so he says, around this throne, there are 24 seats, little thrones. Around the throne, there are these small little thrones encased around it. 24 is a representative number. It's representing Old Covenant and New Covenant, two halves of the church, the Old Testament church, Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, David, uh, Moses. That's the Old Covenant represented by the 12 tribes of Israel. These are God's chosen people. Then the New Covenant represented by the 12 apostles. This is Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Matthew, but 12 apostles. This is the 24. We see this also later in the book of Revelation. It's a representative number of the collective being of the church. The church. The collective being of God's ecclesia. God's called out believers. That's what John saw. He saw the church. He saw me and he saw you encapsulated by these elders who represent them. That's what John saw. I got to stop teaching. I'm so sorry. Our time is up. But I pray that you are hearing this tonight. I pray that it is connecting and you are capturing the word of the Lord tonight. You were made for heaven. You were made for heaven. You were not made for the earth. You were not made to live your life just on this earth. God created you so that you would experience him in fullness. You're stuck. I'm stuck in a human body for 80 years, 90 years, I don't know, 150 for my, my case. And I'm going to do good while I'm here. And I'm going to make the most of my purpose while I'm here. And I'm going to win souls to Christ while I'm here. But this world is not my home. This is not the end of my journey. I have a new over in glory and it's mine it's mine it's all mine Father in Jesus name I thank you God for heaven I thank you for the glory that awaits us the throne that we will stand before the elders who represent us I thank you, God, for the power that we will experience and the beauty and the wonders that we will behold. May it come. May it come. Maranatha. Come even now, even here. May you come. Rescue your church. Call us unto you. Call us unto your name. Release us, God, I pray, from the chains of this mundane world. And let us shine like the glories of the sun. Let us come before the radiance of your beauty. and Bow before your throne and worship you. May it be, God, that we will see and feel and experience all the joys that heaven has to offer. When we make it home, when we make it home, let us be ready for when you call us, we will answer. We pray it in the blessed, beautiful, and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. As we close tonight, would you just worship him for just a moment? Would you just honor the name and the beauty and glory of the Lord tonight? We honor you, Lord, for you are faithful. We honor you, God, for you are worthy. We honor you, God, for you are holy. You are holy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen again. Well, praises to our God. Thank you so much for spending this time with us tonight. I pray 
that you are seeing the Word of God, this book in heaven in such a real and such a fresh way. And I pray that it's having an impact on your life. I hope that it is. Please pray for those folks we mentioned earlier who are going through the illnesses and pray for the recovery of those who've had surgeries today and will have them tomorrow. Pray for one of the officers of our church, one of our security officers, um, Officer Dudley. Her uh, sister went home to be with the Lord just today. She passed away just today. And Officer Dudley came into my office and she said, I know my sister was a believer. We do not weep like others weep, for we know where our loved ones go. So please pray for her family, if you would. I love you so much. I thank God for you. I am honored every single Wednesday night that we come to share together in the Word of God. Keep growing. Keep learning. Keep thriving in Him. We'll see you on next time together. God bless. Love you so much. Take care.